A week yesterday, I reproduced the sign and the word used here on a child who was actually present with us yesterday. The opening of the senses goes back to the early church and applies to every human being who is locked into the envelope of the body. We are in communion with each other and with the world through the envelope of the body until the body is shared. Then the soul perceives directly without the senses. There are some dramatic cases of people who were blind from birth and who had this near-death experience, death actually, and for the first time saw because it was no longer dependent on the senses. And also those who have had this experience will tell you that it's far more immediate. Perception through the senses is quite other. Now we can sharpen our perception if we dumb down something of what in some way obfuscates it and makes it obtuse, e.g. Look at a person coming out of a disco, he can't hear a thing. The same applies if we spend a lot of time listening to words coming at us artificially. After a while what happens? The mind no longer concentrates on the individual word, they just pour over us. Multiply that by a life and you're in trouble. In those long years in France, in complete solitude and silence, every word, even on the page, hit hard. There was no phone, nothing artificial, only the word. And then the senses actually did open on the other side. Now, it's important to bear this in mind because we are our worst enemy in our journey through life by dumbing down our soul. The Lord needs the other mode. An hour, especially fasting, before the Blessed Sacrament, before one is completely contaminated by all the problems of the day, has huge power of intimacy and reception. Beginnings check and consequences follow. Remember now that 2,000 years of experience of Christian prayer in the church, east and west, and the old tradition still held there in the monastic world and in all the eastern bloc is the holy sacrifice as the sun rises. It's different. Why? The body is calm, the heart beats slowly, the mind is empty, nature is tranquil, and we are in receptive mode, and the graces hit us hard and are absorbed by silence after Holy Communion. Compare that with the average situation now, in the Catholic world at least, and I am sure that the pack is not opened. Graces are not absorbed. How can they be, when with the Blessed Sacrament inside us, we're already spouting and emitting like geezers to each other in church? How can the Lord get through to that? And so it matters which celebration we opt for. Now, the Lord never stops trying to get through to his creatures, especially in two domains. One is the orientation of our life, vocation, marriage, whatever. He's interested in the Christian soul, because that soul only has one journey. There's no best rehearsal here. And so, youth is very important, and doesn't old Nick know it? It's only a couple of generations gone by now that people in Catholic schools would have been invited to go to a retreat 
in which different alternatives were given to them. They were placed before their maker, and there were chances for the maker to get through and for good choices to be made before him. How can a young person ever make such a choice now when all he knows is the invitation to pleasure? Pleasure. Where is the pleasure? The body, the envelope. What chance has the soul when the body is so titillated? So vocational work, discernment is very important. Only yesterday I was actually pondering about this very question because it's difficult now for a spiritual director to know where to send vocations that might be out there, and that certainly are out there. One has to know where they can be safe. There aren't many places in Ireland where that's genuinely the case right now. And so one has to know where the Lord really can get through. Because there's no point in going to a seminary where they're being against the current, trying to be orthodox and therefore keeping their mouths shut to survive, or going to a community which is contaminated by forms of modernism. When one can, if one knows where, go to a place where the Lord is genuinely in charge and observe the pattern. Where are the vocations going? But there's another one too. It's the destiny of the soul with regard to the last time. Its own last time and the last things that it's facing. This too involves very much the action of the divine and his providence. Now, as it happens, this is actually a universal experience of mankind. There are in different cultures certain warning signals that somehow the Creator, who is very fair, has given to different cultures which will be picked up within the culture. I don't think it's necessarily to be dismissed the Irish one of the old banshee. Because if it works, the chances are the King of Kings will use it. It's the language that they will understand. One doesn't hear much about it now, partly because there's too much noise. In the Irish countryside of 50 years ago, one heard things, and the local people would know that such and such was probably at risk. Another one that I've encountered quite a lot is this bizarre sign of the white feather, or white feathers. It seems to be an indication, I don't know, this is not dogma, it's curious, I put it to you because it's out there, but it's somehow linked with souls in purgatory. I've seen and heard lots of things on this one. As it were, they're glad and they're being released, whatever it might be. But this one I came across this morning and I was quite actually touched by it because it shows how concerned heaven is for us. Now remember now, this has happened in every culture and without necessarily being Catholic or even Christian, because God wants the soul, and the soul before death sort of thinks it's bound to. You know what happens way back, I think it was my childhood, I remember, when Donald Campbell, wasn't it? He was making the world speed record on water, and it was caught actually on live film. He was taking off this huge high-powered vehicle on the water, getting up to colossal speed, more than anyone before in time, and we saw it with our eyes. It woof like that into the air and came down and he was killed. But the previous evening he'd had a premonition, and the Lord perhaps used what he would understand. He was playing a game of some kind of solitary cards, but he knew things, he was an expert in it, and he saw this pattern coming out in his cards, a combination, and he knew that somebody in history had exactly that combination on the eve of that person's death. And he thought, oh dear. So who knows? Maybe the Lord got him to pray also hard before getting into that lethal vehicle. The Lord wants every bit of him, every bit of humankind that has come out of him to go back to him safe and sound. So this one, I'll tell you as it is. I speak of today, but I shall begin.
This concerns also this weekend, it's our Blessed Lady who's involved. The Queen of Saints, the Blessed Mother, who used a statue, that of Our Lady of Santa Anita, to announce the approaching death of certain people. Located in Santa Anita, Jalisco, Mexico, the statue is a small wooden sculpture, a half, sorry, a foot and a half high, that was brought to Mexico by a European hermit sometime before the year 1700. Before his death, it was given to a pious native named Augustina, who began the custom of carrying the statue to the bedside of the sick. Actually, straight after Mars and after Confessions, I'll be going to the bedside of a person who's dying now in the Athboy area, the mother of somebody who comes here. And the same thing happened actually last week, anointing getting It's a wonderful thing to be next to a person when the person is lucid and going home and is not rebelling. There's a lot of grace in there at that point. Remember this, my friends. Call the priest. Call the priest while the person is still lucid. So, this custom of carrying that statue to the bedside of the sick. It was also the custom for Augustina, upon arriving home, to light a candle before the image and pray for the health of the patient. She soon began to notice that the face of the statue became bright and glowing if the patient was going to recover and would turn dark if the patient was destined to die. In the case of a forewarned death, notice, the Lord is involved, she would exhort the patient to receive the sacraments and die in the grace of God. Remember now, somebody is dying on this planet twice per second, roughly. How many have died since I started this homily? Work it out vaguely in your mind. Where have they gone? When the Franciscans of, now, somewhere in the area, got to know of this secret, they questioned the lady about the phenomenon. As a test, they carried the statue to their monastery. One of the villagers was gravely ill, and as the image was brought to the bedside, the sick friar exclaimed, you are very beautiful, O oh lady, but very dark. Shortly afterwards, he died a holy death. So they became the custodians of this statue. It increased. According to tradition, Our Lady of Santa Anita notified the friars by means of knockings or gulpes when a death was to occur in their community. One incident is quite remarkable. When an elderly friar was ill, his brethren were participating in their daily period of recreation when the sound of shattering glass was heard coming from the sanctuary. They rushed into the church but found nothing out of order. They had just returned to the common room when the sound was repeated. They ran back to the sanctuary. Nothing at all. The sound of the breaking glass was distinctly heard a third time. The same thing. Nothing was broken in the sanctuary. And then the Father Superior declared that perhaps Our Lady wanted to warn the community that one of their members was about to die. They of course thought of their elderly confrere who was ill. Entering the fire cell, the Father Superior whispered in his ear, My brother, I have a message for you from Our Lady. Holding his rosary in his hands, the old religious replied, I know already, I am going to die. Just a few minutes ago, Our Lady knocked on the door three times to tell me. 
In our community in France, where I was for years, the ex prior was a holy, holy man. I never knew him myself because he'd been transferred to the nuns to be their chaplain, the Carthusian nuns. But I knew from my brethren who had to vote on him after his death for the, what is the internal beatification for the Carthusians. And they had to vote unanimously. But there were secrets about him. He never, ever spoke. Only the minimum that he had to. Whatever he did, he did it well and with complete interiority. When he went up the altar steps, from the offertory onwards, he would beam and gaze at a presence. He was only in his mid-sixties and in good health, and something happened. We got this message from the mother prioress, that it was a big surprise that he'd been found dead. But apparently, it wasn't a surprise to him. She went in and found this message. I know the Lord is going to come for me today. I leave you my testament. And I leave this with you from the beyond. Linking it to what I started with. The sealing of the soul by the senses. One phrase. Le secret de la vie intérieure, c'est le saint silence. The secret of the interior life is holy.